Amen. That is a wonderful time of singing praise to our King who did go to the cross for us. And then, of course, a wonderful prayer as well, that we would pursue our King. We pursue our Savior. And uh, I think it's just been great and wonderful that uh, we've been able to experience the hospitality of the body of Christ, uh, greater and outside of us. Uh, so we're thankful to the road for last week and, of course, for this, this time this afternoon that we get to have before we return back. Yeah, thank you. I will mention that we have Jim and Debbie McNeil in the back representing them and hosting us. So if you get a chance to actually thank them in person, that'd be awesome. So we're thankful for all of their time. And, uh, and God is good. God is really good to us. Well, um, it's been mentioned and it's quite evident and obvious that we have new, the new year upon us and uh, the opportunity for resolutions. And of course, you might already have yours all written down, posted on your fridge, um, on your social media. So everyone holds you accountable to it, maybe. I don't know. Uh, something about, you know, your... Your physical appearance and losing weight, I don't know, something about your finances, something about your screen time, who knows? I have no idea what possible things have run through your head, but I will jump on this occasion and uh, be so bold as to say I would like the chance to speak to that before uh, tomorrow begins. Uh, let me add to that a resolution to pursue people, to pursue people. And if you've been around for a little while, you've known that that's actually one of our ministry priorities at MCC that we want to say that when we see ministry and the Great Commission moving forward and happening, we're going to see the proclamation of the Word of God. We're going to see persistent prayer. We're going to see a practice of Christ-likeness. And we're going to see a pursuit of people for the gospel, people to be saved and to be brought into the kingdom, and one another, brothers and sisters in the family, a pursuit of each other for the sake of our own growth and our own Christ-likeness. And so this morning, God so has it, this morning, this afternoon, God so has it that we come to a text that is highlighting that so clearly for us. The need for us to pursue others, to pursue people. So I want to draw your attention to our text, 1 Thessalonians 2. This will be our last time in 1 Thessalonians for the next four weeks or so when we turn and shift to talking about biblical eldership. But for now, 1 Thessalonians 2, let's enjoy our time Wrapping up chapter 2. And look at verses 17 through 20 with me. Paul writes, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Our glory and joy, seeing that in others. Quite an amazing text this morning. And so just to remind you in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 1, we saw Paul's thankfulness overflowing for the Thessalonians and the evidence that God has chosen them and that they truly are saved and all the different characteristics that were showing in their life, the clear salvation that had been brought to them. In chapter 2, Paul shifted to the defense because apparently reports were circulating that Paul wasn't legit. He's not the real deal. He's not a genuine apostle. And maybe he's all in it for his own show, his own fame, his own money, perhaps. And so he defends his ministry in chapter 2. And so we've seen so much of what model leadership in the church needs to look like. In verses, we could say the verses we've just covered in chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, he was defending specifically how he ministered when he was with them in Thessalonica. Now we shift. We're going to shift and he's going to continue to, to defend his ministry, but specifically since he's been away from them. He, since he's been gone from Thessalonica, he's defending his ministry and his genuine care and love for them. So that's where we're going to find some valuable principles to be considered in our ministry to others as Paul had for the Thessalonians. I set up our outline in terms of requirements. So this afternoon, we're going to see three requirements of pursuing people. If we're going to pursue people, we got to have a few things very clear and evident before us, and I think they're modeled perfectly in our text in regard to how Paul pursued the Thessalonians. So first, requirement number one, pursuing people requires desire despite disruptions. Pursuing people requires desire despite disruptions, as we see in verse 17. There it is. Nice. So verse 17 again for us. Let me read that. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. 
the pursuit of people will naturally encounter disruptions. It's a natural thing we can expect. And for Paul, his disruptions came fairly quickly in his pursuit of the Thessalonians. Look at what he says in the beginning of verse 17. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, we were torn away from you. The disruption that Paul faced when ministering to the Thessalonians was persecution. And if you recall, Paul and Silas began to preach Christ in the synagogue meetings at Thessalonica, as was their custom. Then others in the city of Thessalonica began to follow Paul and Silas as well. And then that's when the jealousy of the Jews started to increase. And they formed a mob and they set the city in a violent uproar. And that forced Paul and Silas to be sent away by night from Thessalonica. And so Paul here writes that he was torn away from the Thessalonians. That's the persecution that happened, and it was that feeling. He was torn away from this brand new baby church. It's interesting, the Greek word that's translated torn away in the ESV is ap orphan isthentes, orphan, orphan. You hear it? That's where we're getting our English word, orphan. He's literally saying that he was orphaned from them. That's what he feels like. And this is Paul giving these family metaphors. He's just spilling over with them in all of chapter 2, if you've been paying attention. He keeps calling them brothers, which is, of course, an endearing term for the family of God. But he goes beyond that. If you remember in chapter 2, verse 7, he said, I was like a a nursing mother with you in the gentleness I had with you. And then in verse 11, he said, I was like a father willing to exhort you and tell you the hard things that you needed to hear. Now he says, I was orphaned from you. You guys were ripped away. I felt like someone took away my kids, or they took away my parents, if you will. As a child feels separated and orphaned, that's what Paul felt in this unfortunate circumstance, this disruption that happened. Persecution was probably one of the most common disruptions that Paul faced in his ministry. He was slandered often. He was beaten numerous times. He was arrested on multiple accounts. He was imprisoned. He was stoned even. He was put on trial several times. And he even experienced his fair share of famine and sleepless nights and being involved even in shipwrecks at sea. What do we think from this, though? When we pursue people, we're bound to encounter similar things. We are bound to encounter disruptions. It may not be as strong as the disruptions that Paul experienced in the persecution here, but there can still be disruptions in this priority of pursuing people. A naysayer comes along and disrupts a whole entire relationship you have with a coworker where you're trying to share the gospel with them. Or perhaps God's providence has a brother or sister in Christ just move out of the area, and now you don't have that face-to-face interaction with them all the time. Or bad health postpones or changes some plans that you had made to actually move towards someone, get to know them, potentially even deepen the relationship. Despite these disruptions, pursuing people requires us to remain steadfast and our desire to love them. And that's what Paul did. Paul maintained a strong desire for the Thessalonians despite these disruptions. Keep reading in verse 17. He says, since we are torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, he says, in person, not in heart. We endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. Paul writes to assure the Thessalonians that this was his desire. His desire was to be with them. His desire was to continue a ministry to them face to face. And that desire has not waned one bit. It has not diminished or decreased. And look how repetitive he is on this point. He really desires to minister to the Thessalonians. He says clearly in the very beginning here of the last part of verse 17, in person, not in heart. Yes, we were torn away, but don't you think for one second that I haven't still cared and thought and been desiring to see you. It's only been in person, not in heart. He endeavored, he says, we endeavored to see you face to face. He's attempted to come back to them. He goes on to say, after we endeavored, he says, the more eagerly. I've been eager to do this. And then he adds on top of that, with a great desire. It's interesting because that word desire is oftentimes used for a sinful desire. And yet, Paul borrows it a couple times when he really is trying to communicate how much he loves someone. I had this great, intense desire for you. This is what he's felt. Different translations have creatively tried to show this desire and this kind of piling up of descriptions of how he feels for the Thessalonians. The Net Bible says, we became all the more fervent in our great desire to see you in person. The Christian Standard Bible says, we greatly desired and made every effort to return and see you face to face. The NIV says, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. I think the point is clear. 
The disruptions of Paul's ministry were not enough to derail Paul's desire and longing to minister to the Thessalonians. Though they were out of sight, they were certainly not out of Paul's mind. And it's a point that needs reflection for us all this afternoon. When we encounter disruptions, are we still steadfast in our love for others? Because we encounter them. Do we still have an intense longing to pursue people even when we're prevented from doing so? How eager and willing are we to pursue and serve others? Do we do it really well when it's convenient? Are we about serving others as long as we get something in return? This is not the desire that Paul had for others when he was pursuing people. He pursued people despite those disruptions because it was a genuine desire. It was a real sincere desire he had. Something I think about that's happened recently in the kind of greater body of Christ. We prayed often, if you've been a part of the prayer meetings we've had at 9 9 a.m. beforehand on our services on Sunday, we prayed often for Bill Quinn and his fight and his kind of diminishing health and fighting tumors and, and failing health in that sense. And naturally, we've been praying for God to strengthen them. And it's not like we're thinking, oh, we can only pray for people in our own church. We're praying for people that are even in the state of Idaho because we love him. He's a brother in Christ. And health issues can certainly qualify as a disruption in our lives. We know this. We've experienced this. In a normal routine of serving and caring for others, when health issues hit you, it really can knock you down. But I have to praise God for the reports of how this man has responded. God working in and through Bill, I've heard reports from Matt and Tiffany Critchfield who have been able to go up there and actually visit and try to bring care to him, not wanting him to be down and out, not wanting him to feel like he's sidelined and he's disrupted and he can't do anything. And what the reports are is amazing is that he used every opportunity to encourage them. This disruption, this health setback has only deepened his faith. It's only made him a man further after God's own heart, a man that is deeper in the word and excited to share that with other people, to share with the unbelievers that might be ministering and caring to him in different health settings, to encourage his own family that comes and visits him. He has only continued his pursuit of people. He's not disrupted. He's not sidelined. He's not derailed. He continues in his desire to serve others despite that health disruption. May that be true for all of us as well. So this brings us to requirement number two when it comes to pursuing people. This is in verse 18. Pursuing people requires determination despite deterrence. Pursuing people requires determination despite deterrence. Verse 18, we keep reading on in our text. Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. To build on Paul's desire that he felt, we also see he had determination to do something, to act. His pursuit of the Thessalonians was not only known because he said he had a deep desire to see them. His pursuit of the Thessalonians was known because he actually remained determined to try and get there. He tried to see them again. Paul says it clearly. Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again. He simply states that it was the desire of everyone on the missionary team to return to Thessalonica. It was not a simple visit and saying, oh, we did what we could, and I guess we'll just leave them up to God. God's got them now. He says very clearly, we wanted to come to you. And we know that this was more than desire because of what he says next. I, Paul, again and again, literally once and twice, which is probably this Greek idiom and this way of saying several times, several times I tried to come back to you. The Net Bible translates it, I, Paul, in fact, tried again and again. Simply put, Paul was determined to return to this young church in Thessalonica. He kept trying to return on more than one occasion, is the clear point. It was more than just a desire for Paul. It was a determined plan. It was not simply that Paul got busy with other stuff to do, although that would clearly, in our minds, qualify as maybe a disruption. Because he was a busy guy. He was on his second missionary journey. He's down in Corinth, and he's seeing more people get saved, and he's enduring more persecution. There's a lot on this guy's mind. But that's not what happened. Paul actually tried. He actually tried to come, and yet something prevented him. Before we move forward and talk about that in our text, it's again necessary to stop and reflect on this point. Pursuing people requires determination. It requires determination. A lot of it. People are not easy to love. 
in case you didn't know that. <laughs> they don't simply walk up to you and say, can you just explain the gospel to me? I'd love to get saved today. Can you help me with that? <laughs> and they don't always yield themselves to you and say, hey, is there any scripture you just want to exhort into my life? <laughs> well, what, what, what do you have for me? Just, just hit me. Hit me real hard. Pursuing people often requires making deliberate choices. We need to plan to put ourselves around people. But it's, it's more than that, isn't it? We, we need to, then after that, we need to plan to take an interest in those people. You can't just be in the same room as them. You have to actually now take an interest in that person across the room. But it's more than that. Then we need to actually plan to pray for that person after we've taken an interest in them. But it's more than that. Then we need to plan to actually serve or encourage that person in some way. And then we need to plan to stay in contact with that person and follow up with that. It takes work and determination. And this shouldn't surprise us. What do you do to spend quality time with your spouse? Hey, let me know if anything's wrong, okay? That's not it. You take time. You set aside the time. You deliberately plan to do so. How do you spend quality time with your family? You set aside time and you plan deliberately to do so. It's the same thing with brothers and sisters in Christ. To spend quality time pursuing them with love, we must make plans and we must be determined to follow through. This is what it means to pursue people. We make a purposeful part of our lives the pursuit of people. It may take time, it may take money, or some other form of sacrifice that you didn't expect, but it takes determination on our part to pursue and love people. That's what Paul was doing. That's what he was doing. But our plans to pursue people don't always pan out, do they? We can get disrupted, and we can get deterred, as we're seeing. And Paul had a great desire and determination to visit the Thessalonians, but our text tells us he was hindered. He was hindered. What does it say in verse 18? But Satan hindered us. But Satan hindered us. Despite Paul's best desires and efforts, he was prevented from visiting the Thessalonians. Why? Because Satan had gotten in the way. The Greek word for hindered here, that's in our text, is a word that's used to describe, it's a military word, to describe this military tactic of tearing up a road so that they could not be easily pursued or followed. This is what the enemy would do. Satan is the enemy, and he's the one preventing Paul from acting upon his godly desire, a godly determination to go, to be with these Thessalonians, to encourage them more in their faith as they are but infants. But Satan hindered. He tore up the road and made it impossible for Paul to do so. How does Satan do this exactly? We have no idea. We don't know. Other times we find in the book of Acts, actually, that Paul and the missionaries were prevented from going certain places, and we find explicitly stated in the book of Acts, God prevented them. Sometimes it was the Spirit that didn't even allow them to go to certain locations. But here we see Paul saying specifically that this was Satan's work. And this is Satan's operation. Again, not too surprising for us. Satan loves to try to prevent God's glorious plan from moving forward. He could not stand to see God's rule upon the earth through Adam and Eve, these image bearers in the garden. So what does he do? He shows up to bring the temptation to sin, to make a mess of God's good world. And since then, he's tried over and over to stop and thwart the plan of God. Ironically, we know. We have the picture. We have the story that God has given us in his word. Ironically, his efforts have only advanced God's gracious plan of redemption. A plan that culminated in God's glorious display of love when, when Jesus willingly offered himself up to be crucified on the cross. In the death of Jesus, Satan did in fact bruise Jesus' heel. However, the death and the burial and resurrection of Christ sealed the final victory and outcome of God's final plan. Jesus bruised and crushed the head of Satan in that moment, that ancient serpent. Sin had been forgiven. Sinful slaves had been freed. The penalty and punishment for sin paid in full. A glorious hope and future had been secured in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what's happening now? All across the earth, people are putting their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior and King. And these people are the church of Jesus Christ. And we have an eternal hope that death is not the end, but only the beginning of the eternal life we live with our God and Savior in new heaven and new earth. So what's Satan doing now? He's a wounded foe. It's the best that he can do. 
His eternal death is sealed in the lake of fire. Until then, he's given his last efforts to prevent God's plan. He's shooting the last bullets he has in his gun while he lays on the ground, bleeding to death. His deception blinds him and continues to prowl around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But he's not going to win. He will not win. The Bible is clear that Jesus is victorious. And as his bride, we the church will be victorious with our Savior forever. And so in Paul's ministry, Satan was successful in deterring Paul from returning to the Thessalonians. But in God's perfect plan, Satan only serves as a tool. Just a tool to show how powerful and glorious God really is. So in other words, this prevention is no surprise. No surprise at all. Not to God. In fact, it further serves God's purposes and his will to unfold through the persecution and opposition of the church. Any persecution, any opposition is only serving more God's plan of advancing his glory through the church. We can know this from simple promises like Colossians 1.16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, even Satan in that list. All things were created through him and for him. Satan, in every single one of his attempts, falls right in line with glorifying God. It does not surprise God. And so we have to expect that if we're trying to pursue people for God's glory, we will be deterred. We are in a spiritual war. Satan hates us and all that we stand for. It's not our place to know the specifics of how Satan is hindering us at any given moment of life and ministry, but we must remain determined to serve in the way that God would have us to do so. We must continue our efforts at loving others with the gospel. And think about it. If, if and when we encounter these deterrences, we, we cannot allow them to stop our commitment to serve Christ and others. Imagine going to the park with Evangelism Explosion, with E.E., e. Going there and you're there to find whatever other people at the park might be there on that given evening to try to share the gospel with them. To try to go up and, and say, introduce yourself and say, we're from a local church and we'd love to share the good news with you. And of course, let's, let's say the first person you talk to politely says, I'm not interested, please move along. Well, of course, you're not going to force the gospel on them in that moment, so you will respect them and you will move along. We'd honor that, that, that request. But... We would not quit our evening at that moment, would we? We would not say, wow, that was a bust. I guess I'm never going to try sharing the gospel again. <laughs> that would be silly. That would be ridiculous. Just because one person said no thank you, we're not going to give up. You're going to get deterred. You're going to get hindered. You're going to have moments like that. But that is not means for giving up and quitting. We must continue with the same desire and determination even if we're hit with disruptions and hindrances. And may God help us to do so. A third and final requirement in our text in verses 19 and 20, pursuing people requires delight in the destination. Pursuing people requires delight in the destination. <coughs> verses 19 and 20 to end our text. Paul says, for what is our hope or joy, or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming. Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. So Paul gives a third requirement for pursuing people in our text. And we must be fixated upon the destination or the end. That's what he's saying in this question he asks in verse 19. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? He's looking to the end. Paul sets this up by asking this question. He's jumped out of the present hardship and he's jumped to the end, the actual end, when Jesus comes back. And he speaks with words all pointing that direction. What is our hope, this expectation looking forward? What is our joy that finds ultimate fulfillment in heaven? What is our crown of boasting, looking forward to the future heavenly reward for believers? Of course, his boasting is not in himself, but only in what God has done. And most obviously, Paul plainly says, before our Lord Jesus at his coming. This is the anticipated end for us believers, the return of Jesus Christ. So why? Why does Paul jump to this thought? Why does he jump to this moment, to the end when Jesus comes back? Well, in the midst of disruptions and hindered ministry, 
there is great hope to be drawn from thinking about how it all ends. Looking ahead, where it's all going. For Paul, things would not be disrupted forever. Satan would not hinder plans forever. The time was coming when these difficulties would be removed for good and God's ways would prevail. And this must have been a great encouragement for Paul and the Thessalonians. This must be a huge encouragement for us as well. When we encounter the difficulties and the disruptions in life, it's easy to fixate on that one obstacle. We hit one disruption and all we can do is think about it. And all we can do is obsess over it and complain about it and say, if only this were gone, then I could glorify God. That's not Paul's perspective. All of life should not be defined by one obstacle. We sink down into discontentment and depression and anxiety, and those become prominent as we continue to think about only the hard that we face on this earth. But a change in perspective, a view to the end, a glimpse of Christ returning and gloriously dominating changes everything. It shifts it. We get our heads out of the fog, out of this cloudy mess that we find ourselves in on a Tuesday morning, maybe. You get out of that, and you rise up and you see the whole picture. And there's a day of hope, a day of joy, a reward coming when Christ returns. All will be perfectly settled and dealt with appropriately. But notice what Paul says next in our text. It's a most challenging perspective. Paul doesn't just jump to the end to give us a thought of that glorious moment when Christ is in control and fully shows it on this earth. Paul draws attention also to this delight, this delight he has at the return of Christ. We have our question, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? I don't know if you just saw that question isolated. I don't know how you would answer that. What is your hope at his coming? What is your joy at his coming? What is your crown of boasting at the coming of Christ? Interesting to see Paul's answer. Is it not you? Is it not you, Thessalonians? At the return of Christ, I cannot wait to see you there. At the return of Christ, you are our glory and joy. And most of us, we find great comfort when we think of our eternal destination in heaven with our Savior. We, we think of wonderful things, the, the final removal of sin. Oh, how beautiful that's going to be. No more personal struggles with anger and anxiety and lust and other annoying sins. And we reflect upon the perfect government of God. Thank you, Lord. No more corrupt, sinful rulers over this land. But notice where Paul finds delight. When he thinks about the future reunion that we will have with Jesus Christ at his return, his delight is in the Thessalonians. What is the hope for Paul? It's the church. What is the joy for Paul? It's these Thessalonians. What is the crown or boasting or eternal reward? All these Gentiles who have been saved and brought in to the plan of God. So Paul says, is it not you? You are our glory and joy. Paul's delight when he thinks of Christ's return is people. It's people. And Paul tells the Thessalonians that his desire is genuinely for them, not simply because he tried to visit them multiple times to prove that that was his desire, but Paul's desire is genuinely for the Thessalonians because when Christ comes back, he is certain that he will be delighting in that moment alongside of the Thessalonians. What a challenging thought. What is our delight? What is your delight when you think of the return of Christ? It's true. The removal of sin will be beautiful. And the government of God will be glorious. However, the presence of other humans that we were able to impact for the cause of Christ will be a most unique delight for us. As Paul makes clear. If this was Paul's delight when he considered the end of time then should we not also strive to have that as our same delight? Pursuing people requires us to have a priority on people while we are on earth. Our pursuit of people in this life will come to fruition in delight that we will experience in heaven with one another. So we ought to be able to consider each other in the same way that Paul is considering the Thessalonians. And in considering each other, we ought to pray for such a delight that we can think of one another as our glory and joy. As I mentioned when we started, 
we have our ministry priorities that we've seen and we've kind of seen in the word and tried to bring out for us as a church. The proclamation of the word, the, the practice of Christ like this, persistent prayer. But of course, this afternoon, we focused on this last one, pursuing people, pursuing people. And we've seen some requirements for that. This new year, I, I, I hope you're re-engaged in that pursuit. I hope you're renewed in that desire, in that priority for your life, the pursuit of others. We need desire for others, no matter what disruptions are going to come. We need to have determination in doing this, even if there's hindrances that not can, but certainly will come. And we certainly need to delight in the destination of where this is all going. If we can have these requirements, if we can have these things in our mind and pray for them to be true and real in our heart, then I think you will find the pursuit of people not to be an exhausting one that leaves you empty, but a delightful one that leaves you excited and filled and wanting more of it. Because you're not just excited to see what God's doing now, you just look ahead and you can't get more joyful about what's going to happen in the future. Let's pray and ask God to make this our heart as a church. Heavenly Father, we come before you and in a text like this, this is one of those times where we see examples from your word. And some of them are hard to follow and some of them are really hard to follow. And God, we just ask for your mercy and your strength to follow this example. We want to love people. We want to love people like Christ and we want to have that pursuit of people as Paul exemplified in our text. God, give us a, a genuine desire for others. And give us the ability, the, the strength to move forward. And, and when the disruptions come, God, when, when the difficulties come, and whether that's persecution or some other providence that you allow, God, let us embrace it. And let us know that that's a part of the plan. And we can still pursue people even in the midst of whatever obstacle has come before us. Lord, we just pray for this delight this delight that would be real for us, that we would delight at the thought of standing side by side together, not just now for the sake of the gospel, but in the future when you return. The delight of seeing us matured, not just to a new level, but to, to glory, our glorification. And of course, God, the delight of seeing others who are maybe not here, here yet, that you are giving us time in your patience to preach the gospel to, to see them saved, to see them brought in to your fold. God, make us faithful at this pursuit of people for your sake and out of an example of Christ's love to this world. We pray this in his name. Amen. <coughs>